All right, here in Genesis chapter number 19, we're going to be going through the second half of the chapter. Last week we covered, of course, the first half of the chapter being the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, here in the second half, tonight's sermon is probably going to be a little bit shorter because this, the where I broke this was pretty much, you know, it's where the chapter markers are, the, the, where you have your paragraph markers, that is, and... Uh, what we have left is much smaller, of course, in number than what we had before, and neat as far as like what we can learn from, and then also just content, uh, how many verses we have left. So what we had, as I said, in the first portion of the chapter, the first part was the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and we saw the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah in that. I'm not going to re-preach that or, or, or get on that again, but here in the second half, what you see are the consequences that, that fall upon Lot because of him dwelling in Sodom and Gomorrah. We're going to see that one after another. Now here we're going to begin in verse number 26. We left off in verse 25 last week, so we're going to begin in verse number 26 this week. So look down with me, Genesis 19, verse number 26. The Bible says this, But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became... A pillar of salt. Verse 27. And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld. That means he looked. And then it says this. And lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. Now here in the very... Uh, first, the, the three verses that we read, the very beginning, what we can see are the consequences of Sodom and Gomorrah. Number one, we see in verse number 26, just this small little standalone verse with its own paragraph marker here. It says, but his wife looked back from behind him. This is, this is Lot's wife, of course. But his wife looked back from behind him, and then it says, and she became a pillar of salt. I want you to look over at verse number 17, I believe it is. Yes, verse number 17, it says this. And it came to pass, when they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, this is the angels, escape for thy life. And then he says this, look not behind me, neither stay thou in all the plain. And then he tells them, escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. So, Lest thou be consumed is don't do any of the things that I just told you to do. He said, don't stay in the plane. Don't, uh, you know, he said, don't stay in the plane. He said, escape to the mountain. And then the very first thing that he said was, don't look behind you. We look over at verse number 26, and what does it tell you? But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Now, I want you to turn if you will, to Luke chapter number 17, verse number 31. Because this, this little small verse right there, it's interesting how, how that paragraph marker breaks down. And how we have all of, you know, uh, from 15, or 17, I'm sorry, Genesis 19, we have from verse 17 all the way to verse 25 that's giving you the rundown in context of Lot escaping. But then it breaks off there, and then all by itself, which would seem to be a part of that, the translators put a paragraph marker there, and then they said, they, and then they put verse 26, but his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. And we see something similar to that, is why I point that out in Luke chapter number 17, verse number 31. Luke chapter number 17, as I said, verse number 31, this is discussing the tribulation to come, Jesus is actually speaking to his, to his disciples, and he's warning them. If you look at verse number 31, it says this. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop, and his stuff in the house. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop, and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Now, we're not going to delve into the context of this, but he's warning them about the day of the abomination of desolation when the Antichrist sets up his image, he's taking over. This is basically when it all really, you know, uh, it, it just, it's when the great tribulation begins, okay? So it's getting, you know, very heated. People at this point are going to be beheaded for the cause of Christ. And he's telling you, when you see this, 
the abomination of desolation, you need to just flee. Don't wait. Don't do anything else. You need to just flee. After he says that, then he says this in verse number 32. Remember Lot's wife. That's a scary warning. Just that one statement right there. Remember Lot's wife. You know, I'm so great that we have the Old Testament and the New Testament because just like this, what does Jesus do? He points to the Old Testament to be a warning to us because you may be here for the tribulation. You don't know when you're going to die. You don't know, you know, what era this particularly will occur in, what century that it will happen in. And you have an example of Lot's wife. Go back to Genesis chapter number 19. And what happened here? She's told to flee. She's told it's time to leave. Don't look back. Don't go back and get anything. You know, we just need to get out of the city. And what does she do? She turns around. Well, Jesus is giving the same warning. He's saying, don't wait. Don't go back to get anything. You don't have time to do anything. You know, and we have the comparison of her turning around, just even turning around. Obviously, this was God's wrath in that situation. In the New Testament, this is going to be Satan's wrath. This is going to be the devil's wrath. And why are they parallel? Because you don't have any time when the abomination of desolation begins. That's how bad the persecution is going to be. That God says, don't even go back into your house. Don't even go back, especially speaking to those that are in Jerusalem. Don't even go back into your house to get anything at this point because you could lose your life. And when he parallels that with Lot's wife... I mean, that should be an extra warning of you on the seriousness of what's happening, right? So we see that there in verse number 26 in the very beginning. Look at verse number 27 now, Genesis 19, verse number 27. It says this, And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. I mentioned last week when the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah occurs, how it is fire and brimstone, and that's only found one other place in the entire Bible, in hell. Well, the Bible discusses, you know, uh, there being a smoke of a furnace a couple other times, also discussing that as of hell, too. So that's interesting. Go to verse number 29. It says, And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in the which Lot dwelt. So notice there it says, at their end, it, sa it says that he sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in the which Lot dwelt. But notice why, the phrase right before that, it says that God remembered Abraham. Now, if we were to go back, we're not going to read it, but in Genesis chapter number 18, I don't know if you remember or not, but Abraham was making intercession for the righteous remnant that dwelt in Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, are you going to destroy the, the, you know, the city for 50? Are you going to destroy it for 45? You know, he says, say five. He says 45, and he just keeps going down and down. We can see here who he was really making intercession for was Lot. So... Yes, we know that Lot from the New Testament was a just man. He was a righteous man as far as being saved. We know that he was living a wicked life at this time, but he was a saved man. But on top of that, one of the other factors seemingly why Lot was delivered was because of the intercession that Abraham made for him. You know what that shows you is the importance of prayer on your part for other people. Because you can see that obviously some sort of... There was some sort of effect from Abraham's prayer because it says that God remembered Abraham, right, and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. So we know that, yes, Lot was saved from the New Testament, but when it actually talks about Lot being delivered here, what does it say? That God remembered Abraham. So God was blessing Abraham's intercession that he made for the righteous remnant, and who was it for in particular? We're told that it was for Lot by comparing Scripture with Scripture. Notice here we're seeing repeatedly, though, also I want to point out the consequences of Sodom and Gomorrah. How did it begin? It began with, with Lot's wife turning around. Well, she was told not to turn around. They were told to flee. They were told to leave and go to the country, right, and go to the mountains, it said. He wanted to go to Zoar, right? 
He was, he was told not to turn around, not to get anything. They start up the mountain, and at some point, while the fire and the brimstone is pouring down, Lot's wife turns around. Now, if you go back up to verse number 26, there's something that's very interesting about that. I'm going to compare this with the next verse that we read. <clears throat> Two thoughts. It says this, but his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Now, I want to point out something to you that in this case seems very, it seems, you know, it's, it seems important to me. Now, we see Lot leaving, and he was dwelling with who in the beginning? Who was he with in the first place? Abraham, right? And what was the reason why in which he left his dwelling with Abraham? Because why? Because of strife, because they had too much, too many possessions. So was Lot a poor man when he went into Sodom and Gomorrah? No, he was a wealthy man. Look at verse number 30. It says, And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain, and his two daughters with him, for he dwelled, he feared to dwell in Zoar. And he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. Does he sound like he has a lot of possessions now? You know, number one, what you can learn from this. Is the, again, as I said, what this whole chapter, the end of this chapter is about is the consequences of sin. So God blessed Abraham. God will bless people with riches sometimes. And in this case, God, it was evident that God was blessing Abraham. God was, in some way, maybe by proxy or whatever it may be, he was blessing Lot in some way or another as well. But what happened was Lot left dwelling with the righteous man. God left dwelling with his brethren, where he was at least in some degree serving God. And what did he do? It says there's a major transition that took place that the Bible's teaching you when it tells you that he pitched his tent towards Sodom. What's the point? There's a change that's going on in Lot's life. So he pitched his tent towards Sodom. You know what happened? He had a different mindset. He had a different, you know, uh, the things that were important to him changed. He pitched his tent towards Sodom. He went from having too many riches so that he, he couldn't even dwell with his brother to where he goes into Sodom and Gomorrah, and when he comes out, he's living in a cave with his two daughters. Not only did he, leave, did he lose his riches and his physical possessions, but again, look at verse number 26. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. You know what else he lost? He lost his wife from this. Do you know whose fault that is? It's Lot's fault. You know, the leader of the home is Lot. Something, like I said, that, that seems very that it seems very obvious to me when I read this each time. It, I can understand why a person would say this is minute, but notice where his wife is standing. It says this, but his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Where is she standing? I notice that every time I read that, she's behind him. I'm just telling you my family if, if we were going up a mountain in a type of situation like this, I would have my eyes on my entire family. I would be able to see my children. I would be able to see my wife. I would be watching every one of them because I'm the protector of my home. Because I care about my family. And I'm the one that's responsible for keeping my family alive, for keeping my family safe, for providing for my family. And in this type of situation, what do you see Lot doing? He's literally walking up the mountain and he doesn't even know where his wife is. He, he doesn't, you can say that he knows she's there, but he can't see her. I wonder how long went, how, how, how much time went past before he, he turned around and realized that that was his wife, that pillar of salt. I wonder if he actually, you know, whether it was something loud, I don't know exactly supernaturally how this took place, but maybe he might have hiked up the mountain a quarter of a mile, 200 feet, you have no idea. Might have only been 20 feet, but you know what the point was? The same problem in which why she ended up losing her life in the first place. She shouldn't have been in lot. She shouldn't have been in Sodom and Gomorrah in the first place. You know whose fault it was? Of course, she has to take a personal responsibility to some degree. You know, the Bible says it is better to obey God rather than men. So if your husband is trying to get you to do something horribly wicked or something like that, then you shouldn't do it, right? So she could have lived there and still tried her best to live a righteous life, but she shouldn't be living there. That's obviously not the best thing. But she's dwelling with her husband. She's obeying her husband. But you know whose fault it comes down to? All of it? The husband. You know why? He took her there, number one. He's the one that brought... He made the decision. He pitched his tent towards Sodom. He brought his wife there. He lost all of his possessions. 
and then he ended up losing his wife. And what do we see? We see him not looking over his family. We see him not looking over his wife, even when they're being judged by God. We still see him making the same mistake in which brought him into this mess in the first place. What is he not doing? He's not taking care of his family. He's not looking over his wife. He should have had his, his family in front of him. He should have had his eyes on his family. He should have been paying attention to his family in a situation like this. Look at verse number 30 again. We'll read that once more. And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain, and his two daughters with him, for he, dwelt, he feared to dwell in Zoar. And he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. So we see at this point again, as I pointed out, they have, he has nothing now. Verse 31, And the firstborn said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Verse 32, Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. Now we saw you know, the phrase uh, in, from, in Genesis chapter number 19, you know, that we may know them, right? Well, here we have another euphemism is what is being used. It's, it's, it's a, a more moderate term for something that, that can be graphic, that God wasn't to, doesn't want to go into specifics about. He's, of course, talking about, or she, his daughter is talking about having a sensual relationship in some way with him. So it says here, um, in, read once more there in verse number 31, it says, And the first daughter said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth that says, To come in unto us. Now that is the same as knowing someone. After the manner of all the earth, so she's under the, in the impression that no one is alive. There isn't anyone after, you know, in all the earth, after the manner of all the earth. Verse 32, come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him. And again, that is another euphemism that the Bible uses about, you know, the, the sensual uh, relationship that would take place. And then it says that we may preserve seed of our father. Verse 33, and they made their father drink wine that night. <clears throat> and the firstborn went in and lay with her father. And he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. What do we see further? We see the consequences of Sodom and Gomorrah. We see the consequences of Lot taking his family and putting them in Sodom and Gomorrah. And you say, how do you see that? This perversion has to be taught to people in some way or another. And what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah? What did we see? <coughs> Sexual per perversion. That's where they were taught this. And you know, whose, whose fault it is, again, it's Lot's fault. So we see here that his daughters are obviously, they have a perverted mind. That, that shouldn't be an option, even if they're foolish enough to think that the world, that there's no one else left in the world. The Bible condemns you know, incest, what's going on here. Obviously, the Bible condemns fornication. There's multiple layers of sin that's being committed here. But another thing I want to point out is, and I, I touched on this uh, in the sermon that I preached about Noah, when he became an husband man and then he drank of the wine and became drunk, is the curses of alcohol as well, what you see here. Many times in the Bible you see alcohol used as a tool or, or a, a method of manipulation. And that's what you see here. That right there alone should cause you to stay away from alcohol. Right. When you see the Bible teaching like, hey, I want to get someone, I want, I want to, to get someone in a state where they're not gonna know what I'm doing to them. They wouldn't agree to this, and you know. In a, in a normal state of mind. So I need to, I need something. I'm in need of something that's going to alter their mind where I can get them to do whatever I want. Alcohol, that's perfect. This is not the only incidence of this, either. You know, another one is uh, uh, David and Uriah. I was thinking about that earlier when I was reading this. What happens with David and Uriah? David obviously committed uh, uh, adultery with Bathsheba, she, uh, she comes to him and says, hey, you know, I'm with child. So David calls for Uriah to come. And he's trying to get him to go sleep with his wife. So she can't, so that he won't find out that that is actually David's child. Because if he's not home for 18 months, he realizes, I wasn't here during the conception of this child. and It can't be my child. So right around that time, he wanted Uriah to go and lie with Bathsheba. Well, he doesn't want to. So do you know what you know what David does? 
He gets him wine, and he tries to get him drunken. But he doesn't. He doesn't do it. I don't, I don't even think, I believe maybe he drinks. I don't know. It doesn't mention whether or not he's drunken or not, I don't think. But he lays there, he drinks, and then he lays there at the door and sleeps all night. But that's not the point. David knew what? He's not going to go down there, but you know what I'm going to do? I, I need something. He's not going to do it. I need something to change his mind. I need something so that I can manipulate him to get him to do what I want him to do. That's scary, man. Yeah. That's, that's frightening. You look here in Genesis chapter number 19. Look at verse number 33. And they made their father drink wine that night. And the firstborn went in and lay with her father. And then it says this. And he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. That's scary. That's what alcohol does to you. You know, I, someone can come in, literally, you know, lay with you, molest you, you'll wake up in the morning and not have any idea at all. This being in Genesis chapter number 19 of what we preached about last week, or what I taught about last week, of, you know, the perversion of homosexuals and the perversion of sodomites, these types of things happen all the time in, with homosexuals and their types of behaviors. They go after these types of things, and they constantly, they're, you know, it's not, uh, you know, uh, put on the media as much, just because the media just, you know, tries to manipulate and lie to you to make you think that they're the most wonderful, nice people in the world. But I remember in the past, people talking about all the time, you know, uh, homosexuals uh, date raping people. Like Jeffrey Dahmer, you know what that guy did? You know, Jeffrey Dahmer, you know, I should have mentioned that last week, but of the, here, this would have been a perfect statistic, too. I believe it's 69 of the, like, 72 major serial killers in the history of the United States. There's some sort of qualification that puts them into this specific category of saying, you're a serial killer. Do you know what, do you know what 69 of the 72 have in common? They're a bunch of queers. 69 of the 72 homosexuals in the history or I'm sorry, serial killers in the history of the United States were homosexuals. You think that's a coincidence? Jeffrey Dahmer was well, obviously one of the most well known and all of his all of his victim all of them were men. You know what he did? Look, you know, if you don't want to look it up, don't look it up. But he, you know, you could read about it on like Wikipedia or something, but he would go into into, into queer bars and he would get people drunk, and he would like slip something into their drink and date rape them. You know why? Because he knew I need something. You know, this person, you know, isn't going to do what I want them to do. So I need to give them alcohol. I need to give them this substance. I need to give them this. Isn't that terrible? Yeah. And then that person wakes up, and you know what you can say about that person? They didn't know when they when that person when Jeffrey Dahmer came in and laid down, and when he arose. That's horrible. That's disgusting. Right, right. That's why you stay away from this kind of stuff. Right. That's why you stay away from alcohol. That's why you stay away from just all of the you know, any kind of substance abuse or anything like that. Man. Anything that alters with your mind. You know, you need to, the Bible is very clear that you're supposed to be sober minded. Right. You should always be in your right mind so that you can remember the law of the Lord and make good decisions in your life. Right. Man. Look at verse number 34. It says, and it came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesternight with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night also, and go thou in and lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. So we see that the, the older um, sister is the one that's instigating this, of course. Look at verse number 35. <coughs> And they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him. And he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. So two nights in a row. You see the effectiveness of, of alcohol as well. Being able to, to uh, you know, put you into an unconscious state. It says in verse number 36. We're going to end here in just a moment. Verse number 36. Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. You know what this is? These are the consequences of living in Sodom. Now, what does Sodom represent? Well, obviously, you know, in its, in its most literal sense, Sodom represents 
Today, if you were to look around, just the same thing we're starting to see in the United States, just homosexuals, right? But you know what it also just represents is just living a worldly, sinful life. You have Egypt representing the world in the Bible, right? Everyone is aware of that. You know, but time after time, you see two things used together. You'll see Sodom and Egypt. You know, so Sodom can also, by extension, be a representation of the world. You know what happens is, and this falls on the, the man's shoulders. It is primarily the man's responsibility. He is the spiritual leader of the household, and God holds the man accountable for the spiritual state of the home. So the men need to be especially attentive to things like this. When you see someone who makes a terrible mistake, you need to learn from his mistakes. So what happened was Lot was dwelling and living with Abraham. I'm sure he lived, he learned a lot of good things from Abraham. I'm sure he learned, and that's I'm sure where he got saved. Abraham explained the gospel to him, what he knew at that time, what was revealed in the gospel. He was dwelling with Abraham. They, they departed, and I don't know exactly what began his mindset, but he says that it started with he pitched his tent towards Sodom. Do you know how it ended? His home was destroyed. He lost all of his possessions. His wife died, and both of his daughters ended up bearing his own children and raped him. Let that settle, you know, sit in your mind for a few minutes. You know what that is? That's the consequences of living in Sodom. You can even say this. That's the consequences of pitching your tent towards Sodom. What does it mean to pitch your tent towards Sodom? He wasn't dwelling there yet, was he? But that's how it began. You know, the Bible talks about not making provisions for the flesh. Right? The Bible talks about, you know, the, the concept is taught all throughout the Bible of not, you know, setting yourself up. If you will, we use this phrase, setting yourself up for failure. We're setting yourself up to fall into sin. That's what that means, not making provisions. That's preparations for the flesh. If you struggle with a particular sin, you need to stay as far away from that as you can. If you maybe have a history of alcoholism or you have a history of, of substance abuse or drug abuse or going to clubs or maybe looking at pornography, you need to make sure that you keep that crap away from you as far as you possibly can. You need to take an extra step to stay away from it. You know, we should never in any area of our lives make provisions for the flesh, but you need to be smart enough especially for things that you are more susceptible to to stay away from. But what did it begin with? He pitched his tent toward Sodom. That was the preparation of it. You know what happened next? He moved into Sodom, didn't he? First it starts off with, hey, honey, and this sounds radical, I'm sure, to the whole world. Hey, honey, let's get a TV again. Just start watching television. This is how, that's how it starts off. Well, I don't care whether anybody thinks that's ridiculous or not. What happens is, first you get the television. Then you start watching maybe, hey, let's watch HBO series tonight. Then you start seeing some of the things you used to do, people partying. Hey, that looks fun, doesn't it? Hey, you know, look at that. Doesn't that you remember when we used to do that? That was fun. Just talk about it a few times. You say, oh, I would never do that. Look at Donnie Romero. Right. Yeah, I'm sure he thought the exact same thing, too. People that live righteous lives that are good Christians backslide, and it begins somewhere. It starts somewhere, so you better identify where, where the possible entry point is, and you better not go pitch your tent towards that. Amen. All the areas where it's possible to fall into sin like this, you need to stay as far away as you can. Yeah. And that's exactly, the TV is the, is the perfect example of just pitching your tent towards something. You know what you're doing? You're just sitting back and you're just watching it. That's what he was doing. He just pitched his tent towards Sodom, saying when he woke up in the morning, that's the direction in which his tent faced. So when he got up in the morning, when he sat out like Abraham and, and the three men came, they sat out in the tree that was in front, in front of their, uh, their home, which was a tabernacle at that time, that's where they sat and ate. That's why his, his, you know, his children would have played. That's where they get all of their business. So you know what they were looking at all the time? Sodom. You know, and that's what the television is, I'm sure, today. I know it's getting worse and worse and worse, but you know, I know when I used to possess a television, and that's been like seven, eight years ago, even then it was a bunch, it was Sodom, like literally, it was sodomites, homosexuals on the TV all the time. They gotta throw the one queer guy on every show. You know, and that that kind of stuff, that perverts your mind, that makes you think it's normal. Right. That makes you think it's okay. It causes you to look at things that are perverted. You, you start to forget what's normal and natural. 
Look at Lot's daughters. A normal, natural mind person doesn't do things like this. This is the result. You know what it says about Lot? It didn't just happen to him. It says that he vexed his righteous soul. Do you know what, that, you know what else happened? You know what happened to his daughters? If they were saved, they also vexed their righteous soul. Vexing is like afflicting. You're not, you're human. You're not this indefensible or, you know, you know uh, uh, an indestructible type of being. You will, if you put yourself in a, in a position of temptation, you will fail and you will fall without a shadow of a doubt. Right. You know what happened is Lot took his family to Sodom and they just had the constant influences of sinfulness and wickedness. And we see Lot going so far as to, and it shows the care that he had for his family when he's willing literally to sacrifice his two virgin daughters to a bunch of sodomites. It shows how much he cared for his family even then. It shows how much, I mean, that's like the most precious thing to you would be your daughters. You know, you know, I love my sons, but I'm going to protect my daughters even more so than my sons. Because my sons, when they grow up, they're going to protect themselves when they get older like that. You know? The last thing I'm going to be offering to some stinking nasty sodomite is, is, hey, here's my daughter. It's like, there's not a chance, buddy. Not a chance. It shows you how, how warped Lot's mind is. Yeah. But you know what? It didn't only happen to him. He didn't only vex his righteous soul. You know what he did? He destroyed his children's lives too. Look at the decisions that they're making. Who's, who raised them? And where did they grow up? You don't know how, how long that they were there. They could have been there for 10 years. You don't know how long exactly. I don't believe it. It, it, it tells you. I mean, they're, they're there, I'd say, for at least six or seven years based upon eight, the, the timeline that's given of Abraham. It's almost 10 years probably. Yeah, but they're there long enough either way to where the negative influences so far impact their, to their decision making. To where they're making poor decisions. A decision that's so bad to where they end up bearing their own father's child. I mean, goodness sakes. Have you heard of anything more bizarre than that? Where both daughters are pregnant... With their father's child. Whose fault is it? Lot's fault. That's whose fault it is. Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom. Lot was the one that took his family down to Sodom. Lot, we see that Lot was the one that didn't care about his family. He's, he's offering up his daughters, right? We see Lot is the one that's not watching after his family when they're fleeing destruction. Especially in a moment like that. You know, I, that's, that's just... I can't even imagine, you know, how just, it's hard to understand how far a Christian really can, can get into sin, and how far his, uh, a Christian's mind can really become warped, and how, you know, negatively imp impacted and influenced you can be. But you know what? Don't find out. Right. You know how you don't find out? Don't even pitch your tent towards Sodom. Mm -hmm. Don't even get the TV. Don't even, you know, if, if, if there's a particular billboard, that tempts you, don't drive down that road. If there's, uh, you know, if you have issues on your cell phone, looking at particular things, don't even get on your cell phone. If you, whatever the sin may be, you know, if you have an app, if you can't control yourself on Facebook, whatever it may be, don't get on Facebook. Don't pitch your tent towards Sodom. Don't start down that road because you don't know how bad it could end up. You think a lot. Imagine this. Do you think this is what Lot had in mind when he ended up going into Sodom? I'm sure not. That's ridiculous. But you know what you see in the second half? You know what? I, I, I describe the first half of Genesis 19, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. You know what you have in the second half of Genesis 19? You have the consequences of, of Sodom and Gomorrah. You know on who? On Lot. Yeah, well, here's the thing. Perfect example of this. Fire and brimstone, what does it represent? Hell. That was the beginning of their punishment in hell. That's what that was. That's the only time you ever see fire and brimstone. Those people weren't saved that were left there. They, they were reprobates. That was, that was hell beginning. But do you know who was saved from it? Lot, his family. They were saved. They were righteous. But did, they, did, did Lot just get out free? Scotch free? No, he didn't. What, what does God always do? He'll still punish the Christian. But he'll punish them in this life, on this earth. Just like he punished Lot's wife. She lost her life, right? You know what happened was she ended up loving the world, didn't she? 
She ended up loving Sodom. Why would she have turned around? What's the reason? There's obviously something there she missed. There's obviously something there that she cared about. And she heard or, or, or could see maybe in her peripheral vision the destruction. You know what she did? She turned around to see what was going on. She cared to some degree about it. That's Lot's, that's Lot's problem. That's Lot's fault. He should have been there. He should have taken his family there. He shouldn't have taken his eyes off of his family. So, that's, so what can we learn from this? We see, you know, first half, as I said, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. The second half is very relevant to Christians. And it's the consequences of Sodom and Gomorrah specifically on a Christian. Because, yeah, you're, you know, you're not going to become a homosexual. You're not going to become a sodomite. But you know what? You can turn it on your television. It'll have negative influences on your kids. It'll impact your children. Let your kids around sodomites and see what will happen. I'm not saying literally do that. But that's terrible advice. But you know, you know what would happen is you would destroy their minds. You would destroy you know, their, their morality. You would destroy you know, any, any sort of just their, their conscience, any sort of morality that they naturally have as a child. You would just completely destroy them. You, would, you know what you would end up doing? Destroying their lives. Just like Lot destroyed his whole family's life. He, did, he got out of there, yeah, he, he still had his life. But it was hanging on just by a thread. And I'm sure he was miserable. So, they, he, yeah, he was saved. But you see the consequences on the, on the Christian of Sodom and Gomorrah. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for the, uh, all of the, uh, the examples.